Welcome to a composites video from the Ultralight Airplane Workshop. In this video, we are going to talk about preparing polyethylene tubing for vacuum bagging and vacuum resin effusion. A typical type of tubing used for vacuum resin effusion and vacuum bagging in order to pull vacuum on your part is this polyethylene tubing. Now this particular sample is one quarter inch on the inside and three eighths of an inch on the outside diameter. For the samples that I've been making, this is a perfect size of tubing. It does not restrict any of the resin flow on the input side, at least at the flow rate that I'm using, and it does not restrict airflow on the vacuum side. As far as tools go in dealing with this polyethylene tubing, at the very minimum, you need something to cut the tubing. Now you could get away with using something like a utility knife. As long as you've got something hard to press against, you can cut it fairly easily. You could do it by hand also. I probably wouldn't recommend that. It's slightly more dangerous. What I prefer though is this tool here, and it goes by a number of names. You can call it a utility cutter, a handy cutter, a trim shear. There are quite a few names for this type of device. I've had this one for years and years. I don't remember where it came from, but there are two features about this one that I like. It has an adjustable anvil, so if you happen to resharpen the cutter and it isn't at the same angle it was initially, you can loosen this bolt, clamp it down so that it comes down flat against the anvil and then retighten it back up. Another feature I like about this is it has a locking mechanism so it'll hold it closed it doesn't take up as much room in your tool drawer that way. So these are very nice for cutting off your tubing. Works very well, gives you a fairly sharp edge. It does squish it just a little bit, but that's not typically an issue. It's very safe to use, certainly safer than a utility knife. I did a quick look on Amazon and you can find a number of these that are very similar. Some of them actually use utility knife blades, which is kind of nice. You don't have to worry about resharpening, you just replace the blade. Another good thing about these, since they have quite a bit of cutting force, is that they will also quite easily cut through tubing that has cured epoxy in it. I did an experiment with another kind of tubing cutter not too long ago. I found these really cheap cutters that have something like a utility knife in them. And I thought about using these as a giveaway, but after playing with it for a while, I decided I did not like it. It will cut the tubing, but if there's cured epoxy in it, it almost cannot cut through it. It just doesn't have enough cutting force. It doesn't have leverage that these do. So I gave up on these. But if you want to just cut raw tubing without anything in it, these are adequate. You're going to have to have some way of getting your tubing into your bag. Now, one thing that I used for quite a while were these silicon ports. You put these on your part, wherever you want your epoxy to flow in, and also typically, since there's this groove under here, you'll put spiral tubing underneath that groove. Then what you do is once you have your vacuum bag on and pleated and in place, you'll poke a little hole right here where this port is, then you'll put your tubing down in there, and then you'll run some tacky tape around the top on top of the vacuum bag and up against your tubing and you'll seal it tight. Now, as you can tell, this three quarter inch outside diameter tubing is really kind of small. This is a roughly a one half inch opening. It's just a tiny bit less than that. So this really should be used with a larger tubing. And the reason I say that and why I finally quit using these is that there's enough space in here on the input side where you're pulling your resin in and vacuum resin effusion, this gap will fill up with epoxy. Now typically you can pound the tubing out and it takes a little effort sometimes to get it out, but then it's going to leave epoxy in there and then you've got to knock that out. And I found it to be a little bit tedious on the cleanup to go and, and knock that out of these. And it also generally builds up a little bit of epoxy between the vacuum bag and the outside of this. And that can build up over time and it can get kind of sharp. And so I end up having to clean that off fairly often so I won't accidentally poke a hole in my vacuum bag. So if you do use these, it really should be used with larger tubing unless you can find some of these with a smaller opening. Where I get most of my supplies from, which is Composite Envisions, they only sell this one size, at least so far as I know. 
There are a couple more ways that I know of that you can use to get your vacuum tubing into your vacuum bag. One is fairly similar to the one I just showed you. You go through the vacuum bag where you punch a hole in it, but instead of using a port, you do a slightly different method. Let me give you a little bit of an idea of what it looks like underneath, you know, without the vacuum bag, without the peel ply, without your flow media. Again, in this kind of situation, you're probably going to use a spiral tube. And what I've been doing is I stick a T into my spiral tubing. Now, I'm not going to get into the details on this. I do more work in order to protect the vacuum bag from the edges of spiral tubing. But the tube coming out of your vacuum bag, you put onto the T and push it down tight. But there's some intermediate steps. Without everything in the way, this is what it looks like. Let me show you what the end result looks like and then we'll talk a little bit about the process. This is what the end result looks like. Here's the spiral tubing underneath the vacuum bag, the flow media, and the peel ply. There's a T underneath here in this spiral tubing. And then my polyethylene tubing comes down and onto the T. As you can see, what I do to seal this is very similar to what I use when I use this port. I just put tacky tape around the tubing and over the vacuum bag and seal that off. Let me show you another method that's similar to the one I just showed you for getting the tubing into the vacuum bag. This one's a little bit simpler. This is the one that I typically use while you pull a vacuum. The tubing comes in straight through the tacky tape where the vacuum bag comes to the mold and then it gets plugged into the T. What you want to do is have one wrap around your tubing, put it down on the tacky tape that you've already got, and then you put your vacuum bag down. You don't want to use more than one layer of tacky tape around your tubing. And that's because, as you can see, some of this tacky tape actually gets pulled into the part as you pull the vacuum. If you put too much tacky tape in here, it'll actually pull a whole bunch in and will sometimes pull so much that it'll end up creating an air gap through here and then you've lost your vacuum. This video is about preparing the tubing, so let's talk a little more about that. If you have experience pushing tubing onto T's, you know that's kind of a pain to do. There's something we can do to make that a little bit easier, and that is to use a heat gun. I've been using this heat gun for quite a few samples now. And I've learned a little bit about how to do it and how not to do it. First, let's talk about how you should do it. When you're applying the heat to your tubing, you want to be very near the end, but you don't want to come all the way out to the very end. If you only heat just the tip, what will happen is you'll be able to push it down uh, maybe over the first barb, but then the part behind that will not be soft enough, and it won't go all the way in. You'll get stuck just a little ways down, and it's nice to go all the way down. That will actually help you when you're trying to seal it off, particularly if you're using the method of putting the tubing underneath the vacuum bag where the vacuum bag comes over the edge of the tubing. It's not quite as important when you're doing the method where you poke a hole in the vacuum bag and it comes up through the tubing. It just means you have to use more tacky tape to get the area sealed off. What you want to do then is try to get it softened up back to about here. Now you have to be careful not to come back too far. If you come back too far and it's soft back here, what will happen is it will expand out as you're trying to push the part on and you won't be able to get it on. It will stop about part way and then squish up back here and I'll try to demonstrate that for you. But first, let me demonstrate putting it on the right way. I actually went a little bit longer than I needed to. It's a little bit softer than it needs to be. You have to get it on fairly fast. Once the plastic of the tubing starts touching the cold plastic of the tea, it'll start cooling down rapidly. So you have to get it on there quick before it gets too cooled because once it gets cooled down, it won't want to go on anymore. Let's cut this one off and show you what not to do. Now I'm going to demonstrate what it looks like if you heat the tubing too far back. Here we go. Hopefully I'll demonstrate it correctly. 
As you can see, it's squishing. You don't want that. And there really wasn't much of a difference between where I heated this one and where I heated this one. Let's see if I can show you. When I heated the first one, the end of my tube was not quite centered, but not quite all the way over. It was probably about three quarters of the opening. So this spot got most of the heat and the tip, because there's no tubing over here, heats up even faster than this spot right here. On the second time I heated it, I actually put the end a little bit past my opening. And so the heat all went right here. This tip did not get heated enough to even start to get soft. I don't know if you could tell in the video, but where the tubing gets really warm enough to be soft, it actually starts getting just a little bit clearer. It's almost translucent instead of opaque like this tubing is. Once you start seeing it be a little bit translucent, you don't have to go any farther. When I was doing the good method, only the tip got translucent back to maybe three millimeters, an eighth of an inch, maybe just a little bit more, maybe up to a quarter of an inch. The rest of it wasn't quite that warm. Well, that's how I prepared the tubing to go on my tees. I do want to warn you about one thing on these tees. I accidentally bought some one quarter inch irrigation tubing tees one time. They will not work with this one quarter inch inside diameter tubing. Now, if you got the irrigation tubing and the quarter inch irrigation tees, those would probably work together. For the one quarter inch inside diameter tubing, you need the one quarter inch tees. I've been getting my tees from Composite Envisions but just so I'd have a second source, because sometimes your supplier can run out of stuff, I found that US Plastics has these quarter inch tees. And they are a little bit cheaper than at Composite Envisions. I bought a quantity of 50 for 53 cents a piece, and Composite Envisions were a little over 80 cents a piece. If you are doing vacuum resin effusion, one of the things you'll need to do is run your tubing down into your cup. Now there's also some preparation for the tubing, to do this. One of the things you need to be careful about, and I got caught on this on my last resin infusion, is you want to make sure that you don't have a flat cut on the end of your tubing. What can happen is that the tubing can rest flat against the bottom of your mixing cup, and just due to suction and the viscosity of the epoxy, it can get sealed down against the bottom of your cup. One thing you can do is half of a fish mouth cut. What you want to do is have your cut be about halfway across your tube and then up one side. Let's see if I can show that. Now hopefully you can see it's open here. It's fairly flat here. That will usually work fine to keep it from sealing. Now if you really want to be careful, go ahead and do a fish mouth on the other side too and then you'll definitely not get it sealing against the bottom of the cup. Be careful that you don't make this too large an angle because now, at least in this example, I have to have at least an eighth of an inch of epoxy in the bottom of my cup, otherwise it'll start sucking air. If you really cut this at a high angle, for example, in this case, now I have to have at least a half inch of epoxy in my cup to keep from sucking air. So you don't need to make it at a large angle. If you have a slightly more complex tubing setup, like I have on some of my samples, you'll actually have tees in either the infeed line or the vacuum line. For example, I have a little bypass line that goes from the infeed line to the vacuum line, bypassing the part, so that at the end of the time that I've done the vacuum resin infusion flow, I can open a valve and suck resin from the input side because you'll generally have excess resin on the input side and a little bit less or starved resin on the output side. So if I've had a really really slow flow rate I might be getting close to the working time of my epoxy where it's going to get close to gelling. I can get the excess epoxy that's on my input side removed faster with this bypass line. But in order to do that I use T's in my tubing. One thing I do a little bit extra though, is I try to seal those tees. And let me show you what I do with tacky tape to do that. Now imagine what this looks like without the tacky tape. You've got tubing coming up to the tee here, to the tee here, and down. And there's a little bit of a gap in the middle here. So you've got this location in here. 
that has no tubing. And of course, these are not manufactured perfectly. And there could potentially be little ridges in here that air can escape. So what I do is I wrap about a layer or layer and a half of tacky tape around all these edges at the tubing to try to seal this off just in case there's a little bit of a leak. You really only need this on the input side. It's not as important on the output side. If bubbles happen to get in here and then run over to your resin trap, so what? You'll have just slightly less vacuum, but that's fine. Another fun thing you can do with the heat gun on your tubing is just make bends. This tubing is somewhat flexible. It's a little bit stiff, but a little bit flexible, but it doesn't like to hold a bend. If you bend this tubing, quite a bit even, and then let go, it'll generally reflex back to its original position. What you can do with the heat gun though is heat it up a little bit and add a curve to it. You can see curves here that I put in, a curve here, and I used a heat gun to put that in. And over here, I used a heat gun to put the curves in. You'll do that in a similar fashion to the way you did heating it up for the T's, but what you'll do is wave the heat gun back and forth and turn your tubing to try to get it heated fairly evenly over a long stretch. If you start to see it turn a little translucent, you've gone far enough. What you can do then is gently bend the tubing. Now it stays hot and pliant for a fairly long period of time. You don't generally just want to sit there and hold it until it gets cool. So what I do is I have a cup with water all the way up to the top and then I will dip the tubing into it and out and that's enough to cool it and keep it in that bent position that you're holding it when you put it in the water. If you heat it up too much, you can do what I've done here and you can see where I have kinks in it. I was trying to make a fairly sharp bend and I heated it up too much. I was, this is the very first bend I ever made and so I was learning how to do it. Now another method to do it instead of trying to do it freehand is to hold it down against a solid surface and then heat it in one spot. And then as it gently bends, you push it a little farther along and heat a little farther along and keep putting pressure on it and you can actually get it into a fairly nice bent shape. That mechanism works pretty well. So you can see on this bend, it's not a real sharp bend, but I was able to make the bend without putting kinks in it. Now kinks on the vacuum side probably don't matter as long as they're not so deep that they cut off the airflow. Air flows pretty easily through a narrow spot, but on the input side where you're trying to pull resin, you really don't want kinks. I do have a cautionary tale for you. The vacuum tubing that I've been getting from Composite and Visions is polyethylene. I did a little experiment with polypropylene that I bought from US Plastics about at the same time that I bought my T's just as an experiment to see how it worked. work. It's the right size tubing. It is much stiffer than the polyethylene, at least the version I bought. The hardness of it is uh, specified as R100. They do make an R75, which should be softer, but it is also more expensive. The tubing I've been showing you in this video that's already bent and is on a part is the polypropylene. So bending it works great. Heating it up, bending it, putting it on all tees, all of that worked fantastic. I ran into a problem though. When I went to pull my first vacuum, I could not get a good vacuum seal. Now I figured that typically I had a little gap somewhere in my bag. So I did lots and lots of searching and I could not find it and it was a pretty significant leak. I finally traced it back to the input tube where you draw the resin from. The clamp I was using is this clamp here, and I had that thing clamped down fairly tight, so I thought, well, maybe I just didn't have it tight enough. So I clamped it down just as far and as hard as I could tighten it. It was still leaking. This clamp was not able to squish that tubing enough to seal it shut. It works great with the polyethylene tubing, but with this R100 polypropylene, it could not seal it. What I finally ended up doing, because I didn't want to pull the vacuum bag off and start over again, I went and got my vice grips and clamped down on it. That worked pretty well. It did not seal it off completely, but it came very, very close. There's a problem with using this vice grip is it has a very sharp edge on it. And if you clamp down hard enough, it's going to slice that tubing off. So I had a little balancing act to clamp it hard enough to seal it shut, but not slice the tubing. So that's kind of a cautionary tale. I would not use the R100 
polypropylene. I'm going to stick with polyethylene from now on because I know these clamps work great on it. In fact, when I was trying to deal with this, I tried all a kind of clamps. I have a much heavier clamp that's for much large tubing. I tried that. I have some automotive clamps. I tried that. They didn't work. So really the vice grips was the only thing I was able to get on there to close off that tubing. I was able to finally get the vacuum infused. One of the problems I had, and I knew I would have it, but I just decided to leave it. I didn't have another vice grip. My bypass tubing kept leaking resin through it because I could not clamp it down enough to stop the flow of resin. And I used my big clamp, clamp down as hard as I could, and it just would not work. So I ended up having to mix a second batch of resin and put that into my mixing cup just so I'd have enough epoxy to finish my infusion. So I ended up with a big puck of epoxy in my resin trap. I did a little price checking on that polyethylene tubing also. From US Plastics, I can get 100 foot for around $15. 100 foot from Composite Envisions is around $20. If I'm already doing an order from Composite Envisions and I need some polyethylene tubing, I'll probably just go ahead and order it from Composite Envisions. If I happen to run out of that polyethylene when I don't really need anything from Composite Envisions, I might order it from US Plastics. I do want to qualify that although I have tried this polypropylene tubing from US Plastics, I have not yet tried their polyethylene tubing. And at some point in the future, I will try it. And if I have a problem, I'll let you know. If you have any tips or tricks for preparing tubing for vacuum bagging or vacuum resin infusion, Leave a comment down in the comment section for this video. If you'd like to see more of these types of videos, I'll put a playlist down here in the lower left hand corner that you can click on and go to more of these types of videos. I do have a playlist for the videos that have been produced for designing the UWS-1 ultralight airplane. I'll put a link to the playlist up here in the upper left hand corner. If you'd like to subscribe to the channel, haven't done it yet, click on this little symbol down here in the lower right hand corner and that will get you subscribed to the channel. Stay tuned to the channel because there's more of these videos coming.